I'm Trudy Kerr and welcome to The Interviewer. In this series, I talk to artists, campaigners, men and women of influence, musicians, performers, sportsmen and women, politicians, businessmen and women, and anyone who shapes the fabric of our society. I met today's guest at the premiere of The Boat, a film which has five lines of dialogue, a single actor, and an inanimate co-host. Now, all things being equal, it doesn't sound like it should be a stunning, nail-biting thriller, but thanks to the outstanding direction and my guest's incredible portrayal of the lead, it really is one of the best films of the thriller genre that I have ever seen. Joe Azapardi is an actor and producer, best known for 13 Hours, The Boat, and The Win Way of the Wind. Joe is Maltese born, bred, and based, but hit the headlines just over a week ago when he used his acceptance speech at the Malta Film Awards for his role in The Boat, which won Best Film, to speak out about the controversy regarding the amount of money ploughed into the awards in contrast to the funding the industry receives. Joe stated, I don't need to tell you all here how hard it is to make a film. The hardest part being funding. As beautiful as investing in these awards are tonight, I think investing in our indigenous films are more important. The awards had also indeed been boycotted by Oscar-nominated and award-winning Lutsu and other acclaimed films such as Simshaw and Limestone Cowboy. We're going to be talking about that, but first of all, welcome, Joe! Hello, Trudy, and can I just say, I don't think anybody has ever introed me as kindly and as wonderfully as you just did. It's, I think I've, probably the only other intro I've had in my life has been somebody saying, I'm here at an after-party, being like, oh, Joe's here! So... This beat it, for sure. Thank you. You are so welcome. <laughs> Graced. Um, I do have a bit of a bone to pick with you. Uh, we will talk about the industry and the awards and all that rest a little bit later on. But I do want to congratulate you for the award for The Boat. Uh, for anyone who hasn't seen this, I'm going to be honest. I went to the premiere. I was invited and I was a complete skeptic. I was, I'd read up about it and I was like, are you serious? And I came out with bitten nails a fear of fog and a fear of boats because it really is excellent. So the, the story, just give me a brief recap of the story. So um, <clears throat> it is all about a fisherman who goes out on an early morning fish in the morning and just goes beyond the point where he can't see Malta anymore. And he gets surrounded by sea fog. And while he's in the sea fog, he uh, bumps into a boat and he checks this boat to see if anybody's on it and it turns out to be abandoned. He ties his little boat onto the big boat, gets on, sees it's abandoned, and when he tries to get onto his little boat, it's gone. And it's now his struggle of trying to get this sailing boat to land. Eventually the fog wears away and throughout the story, we're constantly asking ourselves whether there is some, whether there is somebody on this boat doing this to him because the it, it does get a bit manic and mad after the circumstances that befall him on the boat. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to give away the ending at all because it's yeah. very much under audience interpretation. But it is 90 minutes of me on a boat. I know it doesn't sound very entertaining, but it does keep you at the edge of your seats. I, I, well, and this is the thing. I was really, Joe, I was really surprised because I really was sceptical. I, I, I was like, uh, how fun can this be? But even today in preparation to talk to you, I recapped and then I remembered that the last time I watched it, I couldn't sleep for about a week and I literally bit every nail off my hands. Oh, is that what happened to your nails? Yes. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, these I'm are joking. Just, they look wonderful. Thank they you. They, these nails. have just been done. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Jeez, cheeky as you are. But it, it really is a brilliant film. Thank you. What happened to the boat after the premiere? Where did it go? Where did it reach? And did it live up to your expectations? Um, it did and more, actually. You know, the we got a big cinema release. We managed to attach some sales agents beforehand and we managed to get a worldwide cinema release showing in... Uh, I think we did about 35 to 40 territories in the end, cinema release. But that wasn't the overall objective of the film because, as you know now, the industry's moved towards online streaming. And it's quite beautiful in a way because when a film 
has its run at the cinema if you don't get a chance to watch it it's done unless you or you know you can't even buy a dvd of stuff anymore dvds are kind of out the door um and what immortalizes a film is watching it on a streaming platform which we were lucky enough to get as well it's on amazon prime in the uk and the us unfortunately not on the malta store though so if you want to watch it in malta just contact me i'll send it to you i'm yeah. easy <laughs> i'm easy like, I, just want everyone to watch I, it. I don't want to make money off this i just want people to see it you know i just love the film <laughs> it, i mean it is great it is a great film and i'm, I'm sort of slightly glad that it's not on uh on Amazon or in Malta because I would be tempted to watch it again and then I'd another week of sleepless nights. Thank you very much indeed. I'm really glad that it lived up to your expectations and I'm really glad that it actually superseded your expectations. What have you been doing since then? So since then, I kind of, I don't just act. I um, work in film production as well. So I work in the servicing industry of Malta, um, part of Latina Pictures, and I service pretty much all the big shoots that come to Malta. I started off my career as an AD, as an assistant director, which I loved as well because it's very, it's not just being behind the camera and think it's a slave job. It's very creative. I um, I get to, you know, have about 300 extras and I need to give them all background action and give them something to do. So I'm just creating little stories, being like, if I get a couple, okay, be like, you've got to walk down this street, go like just past camera. So you've had a massive fight with him, okay? So you're storming ahead and you're, and you're, you're so sorry to your wife and you're going, no, 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 come back. So you have, and you have to do this with about 300 people, you know, give them all little stories to do, all little objectives. And they, and while the two actors are there in front of the screen making the having their scene the all this background action which you barely notice usually in a film would have been created by yours truly well, hello. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't even know that happened yeah that's yeah no it's a big part of the job watching directors work with actors and how they direct them also i think made me a better actor at the end of the day because i got to watch you know this yeah and i got to work with on top level films i got to work on assassin's creed murder on the orient express um the last jurassic world i actually didn't ad that one because i actually got a part in it which hopefully um will make the, the final jurassic the last well, jurassic world idiot. yes i'm the only maltese actor i believe in it and don't think that this is going to be one big old malta scene for me because i've literally i think i'm a sniper on a roof with like two lines maybe you will see me but it's you know blinking you might miss <laughs> but then you talked about um being an actor and you talked about being an assistant director which if you had to choose would be the one that you would always opt for acting 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 any day acting is my craft my passion and my and how i put my artistic self out there i believe so your preference would be acting and you are now production managing as part of what you do within the industry as well. So here's the big crunch question. What happened over COVID? So what happened really with Jurassic World is I had actually quite a really decent part in the beginning as like the, the multi-smuggler. But then as soon as COVID hit, they had a big rewrite and my part ended up getting reduced. What to did they rewrite? Minor. Um, because so originally they were going to shoot both main unit and second unit in Malta. Okay, but they were explain <clears> that. So the main unit shoot would be with the director of the film, which is Colin Trevorrow, and he will... Di that's usually what the actors are involved in. And then second unit stuff is usually stunts, stunt doubles, you know, where you're not dealing with the actors. It will be done by a different director. And when COVID hits, they didn't really want to bring the actors over to Malta, so they ended up just shooting the second unit stuff over oh, here. Oh, wow, okay. That's how it transpired, and my part got reduced. Um, but in terms of it, you know, it didn't slow the industry down at all, COVID. It's, it's like the, I you know, because maybe they did for the smaller shoots, but I work with studios mostly, you know, Apple, Spielberg Studio. Um, I, I, yeah, so they've got, if they've got the money to increase it, they will. And I mean, I, I know Jurassic increased their budget for COVID by a few million. It took a lot to like to put it out. So if a studio has the money to do it, then it can. But studios put a lot of red tape over it. You know, you've got to, they don't want anybody catching the virus. So we get tested. The last production I worked on, we got tested every single day. You know, when I worked on, I worked on Foundation at the beginning of the year, which is Apple's biggest budget series. And we got tested maybe three times a day, but it involves lots of COVID marshals around set. It involves a whole COVID department. It involves a Zoom every evening on deterring COVID. There's a lot that goes into it. And I started as a production manager with COVID. And as if producing a film wasn't hard enough before, doing it with COVID is a monster it's a nightmare honestly because it's not and also it's about spacing as well you've got to double the budget because even if you're doing something as simple as organizing a van for 
the crew to get from the hotel to the set. You don't just order one van because you need to be half the occupancy because of COVID. So you need to order double the amount of vans and and you can't just call crew members in the next day. You've got to call, you know, you've got to test them one day, double test them the next day and then call them in. So if you need help in the sound department, you've got to give me a three day window to be able to vet that Blimey person and get them in. It's, no, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. But you know what? So I, I, hopefully when COVID does eventually go away, I, any job is going to be a breeze after <laughs> this. Better what I have been through with the last two productions I've done. My God. The irony is that for actors, for stage actors, and stage actors who are friends of mine, obviously their, their career has been decimated. But of course, over the COVID period... The, the viewing, viewership on, on Apple, on Netflix, or, or, and all these online streamings went through the roof. So you would anticipate that production would have to compensate for COVID because the demand was there. I suppose so, yes. And my heart absolutely goes out to theatre out there, you know, the West End performers, because a lot of them are my friends and COVID is a horrible period for them. You know, you have these... So, these extremely talented stage performers, musical theatre performers who just had to, you know, get a job at a bar somewhere, you know, and these, and these are people who audiences would applaud for on end, you know, and they just didn't have any work. I still think theatre is in some way the crux of acting, the where you really, you know, you will spend four weeks dissecting a script, rehearsing it in every single way possible, and then eventually getting up to this performance where you just have to nail it and one. It's a beautiful thing, the whole, the experience of putting a stage production together. Whereas on when you come to a film, you've, you know, you maybe will meet the director a couple of times before, have one rehearsal, if you're lucky, if you get to have a rehearsal with the other actor, and then you're on there <clears throat> with about, what, a whole film crew of 300 people watching you do this scene, you've got to do it in like two or three takes, and you let's move on. But it's a don't, completely different process. Do you think that theatre is going to recover? Do you not think we as consumers now of theatre, film, have become really lazy through covid I see it, well, from somebody who does go to theatre and loves theatre, I don't see how you can avoid it, really. But it, you're but, in the business. But I'm in the business, yes, I know. And I'm not, to be honest, you know what, it might not even be being part of the business. It might just be, as you said, are you lazy enough to get off your ass and go watch a show? Or do you just want to sit on the couch like you do every night and just watch something on TV? Which is fine, you know. I could be on the stage or on TV. You're watching me either way. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't care. Just yeah, look at me. Look at me, look no, at me. Okay. Eyes on, eyes on, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I truly hope that people do, and I do think it's very unfair how, for some reason, theatre in Malta, the restrictions held against them have been so much worse. Before we talk about funding and the controversy of the awards, which we'll come to in just a second, let's talk about the Maltese film industry, because both local and international. I need this explained to me, because I interviewed Jesmar and Michaela from Lutsu, and not only is this an incredible personal story for Jesmar, I mean, it's an incredible story, but the film is also multi-award winning, including Sundance Festival, and now nominated and put forward for uh, Oscar, towards the Oscars. So... Isn't the film, the Maltese film industry thriving? <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't say it was thriving. I think thriving would be, you know, if we had a plethora of films that we could choose from, not just a film or two that comes out every year, that really, you know, which is kind of like how it is at the moment. Um, if there were more funding options available, and not just locally, you know, these could be European funding schemes as well that we could apply for. Um, but I'm not sure if any of these films that you mentioned were actually helped by the Film Commission, you know, they were kind of, I, I know Blood on the Crown was, but in terms of the actual funding of them, these producers would have had to fight and work tooth and nail to get any like sort of a budget to try and make this. It wouldn't just be as easy as applying for funding, getting it, okay, let's go. You know, when I did the boat, we applied for the 120,000 grant from the Film Commission, but I can tell you that is nowhere near enough to make a film if you want to film on any... And we were very lucky. We had a private investor who um, helped us out and gave us pretty much the budget we needed. Um, but it's hard. We're going to come to that commercial aspect and the viability of putting a, a film together in Malta, but, but surely if the boat and... Simshaw and 
Lutsu are doing well. And we are an island that is tiny. Mm -hmm. I mean, surely that's good news. Surely Maltese film is doing well. It is great news. No, it is great news that they are traveling overseas, that they're finally getting there. But again, it's a handful of films. If we had more content, we could be like re we could be reaching even further heights overseas. We could be doing it. And but the thing is, look, I don't want to. <clears throat> I don't want to knock the Film Commission in any way because what they have done for the servicing industry has been vital to us making these films. So the fact that Maltese filmmakers have got to work with these fantastic foreign crews that we have worked with has given us so much great knowledge and so much great experience. Explain this to me, okay, because this leads me right into the next question. I need to disseminate okay. this and break this down okay. as well because Malta has been the location for filming some massive blockbusters. Huge. Probably the most famous I can think of is Gladiator, largely because I watched it maybe a dozen, two dozen times. Now, this may sound blonde, but what is the difference between a film industry and the Malta film industry? Isn't it just the same thing? What, what are we talking about? Because we're talking so, about <clears throat> Malta film industry, but yet these big blockbusters are made here. understand. So there is the servicing industry of Malta, which is the company that I work for, Latina Pictures, which bring huge, big foreign production. It doesn't even need to be huge. There can even be some like small Italian films that decide to come over. And you, these films will decide, right, I would like to come shoot something in Malta. They would contact one of the service providers over here and we would set up the shoot for them. But it will not be a local film. The money will be coming from abroad. The crews will be coming from abroad. We will have local crew helping out but usually they won't be at an HOD level they would be below that so that would be the servicing industry and then there's the local industry which is local Maltese films being made and they don't need to be in Maltese like the boat really didn't have much to do with Malta other than the fact that the boat got there at the end but it was a locally made film by local producers local director and what I was getting to <clears throat> before was being that we would not be able to make local content if we didn't service so the film what the film commission have done with upping the cash rebate for when foreign productions come over to Malta has been vital to us being able to make a film. Because, yeah, as the films I've mentioned to you, we've got to work with huge scale people and we've learned so much of them. And Ridley Scott, as you mentioned, I'm working with Ridley Scott on the next film, on the Napoleon film. So you have the, the advantage of working with these huge names, but you keep mentioning, mentioning funding. So I'm going to come back and ask you about funding because I need this explained to me. If a film like The Boat or Lutsu does incredibly well on an international level, on a commercial level, you said yourself it exceeded expectations. It went into the cinema. It's now streaming on Amazon in two countries. Why do you need funding? Because surely that's a commercial venture that is doing really well. Who in their right mind would support a commercial venture that is doomed to fail? Why would you do that? Absolutely, but in order to make these films, you need the initial funding. And <clears throat> we got lucky with the boat. You know, we just happened to find an investor that loved sailing, loved the story, and gave us the money for it. And I can't speak for Lutsu, I can't speak for Simsha, I can't speak for any of these that were privately invested before, but it may just be the same case that, you know, they found somebody who had the money to do it and gave it to them. I believe how it should be done, and the whole reason the Film Commission of Malta was probably set up back in the day was f to try and start a local industry and to bring foreign productions over. Yes, as I said, it's very important. But <clears throat> there needs to be some more financial incentives for us because there... You know, having to fight to make these productions is just not good enough. We should be, we, they, they should be willing to just get in there and, you know, be like, we should have a bunch of stories ready to go and they should like be able to pick the best stories and not just be focusing all the government funds on the servicing industry. But now it's time to evolve. Now it's time for us to say, we've got the knowledge, we've got what we needed to know, and now it's time for us to make our own stories. And I mean, we've got a great history in Malta, you know, there's so much stuff we can talk about. God, the Great Siege, how have we not done the story of the Great Siege yet? It's a fantastic story. Why? Because it needs a lot of money to do it, because it's a period piece. And this is the thing as well, because lots of Maltese crew members are rightly in thinking that they will only get paid well and handsomely if they worked on a foreign production because they obviously have huge budgets. Whereas when you work on a Maltese production, 
you will have to take a pay hit, but there's some sense of this beautiful patriotism and this national pride when you are doing something local, you know? And I've spoken to a lot of filmmakers, a lot of Maltese crew members now who actually will take the pay cut and do something local because they believe in this industry and they believe that we have great stories to tell. But it's a, to me, it's a no-brainer when you look at something like The Boat or Lutsu, and Lutsu being in, in Maltese. So again, with a huge amount of respect. There are so few people around the world that actually speak Maltese. I was also surprised that it did so well in that regard as well. But take the boat. Commercially, it's a viable opportunity. And I assume that the the funding has uh, its return on investment. It has benefits. It can, and hopefully private investors will see that there is money to be made from films like this. But again, Trudy, you've said, you know, you've mentioned The Boat, you've mentioned Lutsu, you've mentioned Shimsha, you've mentioned three films. And we <laughs> look how long the Maltese film industry has been running for, you know. That's, there have been more films, you know, but they've been a lot, like, maybe on a lesser scale with less of a budget. But we need more. We can't just, like, say that this, like, our entire, I can count the entire, our entire film history, our indigenous film history on one hand, you know. I want to be, I want to be, instead of mentioning, I want to be, I want to have discussions about Maltese films where you can name it, like, the history of Maltese films and what we've done and who produced that and what we've done. You know. And we're not getting that. Because when you first mentioned it to me about uh, Malta being able to produce these films, I was thinking to myself, hang on a second, we're an island of, what, half a million people. But when you talk about putting it in the context of these blockbusters coming here, having the resources, having the studios, having the, the people who know how to do it, then suddenly I'm understanding, yes, this should be an industry that should thoroughly be supported. Now I'm going to ask you about what you said at the awards. I want to say, first of all, massive congratulations on the award. So well deserved. I was fighting for you to get best actor. I was there. Because I, I wasn't even nominated for I best actor. I know you weren't. <laughs> I, I worked out that maybe because you only had five, five lines of dialogue. But was, I you know what? So did Harvey Keitel. <laughs> I would have been cheering for you. I'd have been standing up going, yo, yo, Joe, Joe. <laughs> But let's talk about that for a second because the, the awards were boycotted by these some of these big films. Simshaw, Limestone Cowboy, Lutsu, to, to name three. And... That was a clear sign that the news that had come out that 40, 400,000 euros had been invested in the awards, 600,000 was the annual investment into the industry. And with all due respect, the math doesn't work. It doesn't work. But you boldly stood up. You went anyway and you boldly stood up and made your statement. A couple of questions for you. Did you ever feel that it was appropriate to boycott? like your peers? Hmm. I think what the whole Celebrazioni campaign are doing at the moment is great because it's shedding light on the issues that we've been discussing today, you know, the lack of funding, the lack of opportunities for local filmmakers. So I do believe in it. And to a certain extent, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about boycotting it myself at a stage, you know, but... Would I just be that silent person that just, you know, posts a status on Facebook or Instagram every once in a while and disapproves of it? I think the platform which I took to get up there and say that had more of an impact. <clears throat> and it's created discussions, you know, it's created awareness to it. And I'm, I didn't want to get anybody in trouble in any way, by the way, by saying what I said. But I do feel like it needed to be said and you took the opportunity to say it. Yes, it was something, that, and you know what, actually before that, I was, I got up on that stage and I was literally like, don't say it, don't say it, don't do it, don't do it, smile and wave, smile and wave, everyone says, you have a lovely smile, just smile, oh fuck it, I'm doing it, <laughs> and it just came out, and I was, once I started saying it, I'm like, I'm going to have to look, go through with this now, and it just steamrolled out, but I mean, I didn't really plan on it much from beforehand, but the moment I set through those doors and I saw what I saw and I saw the stage because I mean honestly it was phenomenal it was a phenomenal show like the stage the way it looked like it was great again stage work was all being done by foreign guys when it could be done by somebody locally you know they had to hire outskirt people to do this and it could have been done on a less Why? it could have because they wanted it to be a spectacle you know there were ministers attending this event so it obviously had to be um it had to be it had to look great 
you know, it's a lot of what the government do at the moment, really. Yeah, it's but isn't there, isn't there people inside Malta? Sorry, but if the stage managers, stage production people are good enough, let's say, for international films to come here, are they not good enough for a local film festival? Absolutely, they are. We're talking about a massive need of cultural change. Yes, yeah. And again, it stems from there. But when I walked through that door and I, uh, I saw, I saw, I don't know, I just, it didn't really sit right with me when we were offered 120 grand to make a film and there's clearly millions being spent on... So, I mean, look, the awards, I mean, they were, they were a success in some people's eyes, you know. It did spark eyes on the industry in Malta. We were mentioning the Hollywood Reporter, you know, it was internet. We had Colin Trevorrow, the director of Jurassic over. We had big names, Roland Joffe. There were some, some great people that attended the event, and it has spread the word that Malta is on the map now. But I think that could have been done without pumping the money into it, basically. You think that the awards... The boycott, yourself, what you said, you think that's going to make a change? Are we going to see a change? Are we going to see we are. a new Malta film industry? We are. And the Film Commission have said that by May, we are going to see it. There's a plan involved. I don't know what the plan is at the moment. could just be an extra fiver. <laughs> it, could be, uh, it could be three or four funds, you know, some student funds, some feature film funds, TV series funds. It could be anything, you know. But they've promised us that by May, there are going to be more opportunities for us. And I don't think it's right to keep bickering about the past anymore. But I think the focus and what we should do is really to look forward to May and to see these funding opportunities and to finally see a change. I think all the whole Celebrazione campaign and all local filmmakers are going to be really, really excited to see this. And if it doesn't happen, then... What would be the absolute ideal scenario? Um, I mean, I can't put a number on how much I want the funds to be, just more opportunities. It's, it's just an opportunity thing. And it doesn't even need to be funding a film. It could be bringing fantastic directors, fantastic director of photographies down to teach local filmmakers how they do their stuff, you know? We, I've been graced on working on all these big film sets because I've got to work with these guys. For, for, I got paid to work with these guys. It's been great. Some people in Malta may have the talent, but they don't have those opportunities per se. So let's get a director over, you know, and just pay him a bunch of money, tea, and do like a week's long workshop with them, with a director of photography, even with a key grip, you know? There's so, there's so much more you can do to make our films about us, yeah. One last question for you, Joe, as a party. What is up next for you? Are we going to see another boat? Are we going to see boat two? Oh, God, I don't think I could do that again. <laughs> I get me get me off that boat. No, actually, can I can I tell you a quick story about the boat, please? Because so, in order to successfully film the boat, we had to we had to shoot with two boats. Basically, we shot with um, our family boat, which was the boat we used for all out at sea, all the beauty shots, you know, going through the waves. And then we had to use a double boat, which we would put in the filming tanks of Malta. And we had to be horrible to this boat because you saw the boat half sunk in it, you know, so yeah. So I had to take, and we found a boat exactly identical to it in Croatia. And it was up to me and three other guys to sail this boat from Croatia to Malta. It took six days to do. And this boat was auditioning the whole way <laughs> to Malta because it, I mean, as soon as we left the harbour, we tore the sails, we hit a reef. We lot, I was going across from Italy, from Croatia to Italy and um, I lost steering on the boat, couldn't steer the boat. I had to find something called an emergency tiller, plug it right in and head back to Croatia, repair and keep going. Anyway, this boat was being a nightmare. And there was one thing which the owner said, the, but like, if there's one thing that's good about this is the engine. She said, the engine will never die on you. She'll get you right to Malta. And then it was the final stretch going from Sicily to Malta. And we were on a collision course with a tanker at a moment. And the moment we started to veer off from this tanker, doo -doo -doo, goes down. Exactly like in the film. And I was like, this can't be fucking happening to us right now. I think the guy, the navigator at one point was like, that's it, abandon ship, get off. I'm like, no, 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 no. But thankfully we had a guy on board who knew a bunch about engines. Kenneth, thank you so much. <laughs> and he sorted it all out for us and managed to get it. And do you know what the cherry on the cake was, Trudy? The cherry on the cake. We 
got to through the Maltese harbour. And usually sometimes when you are bringing a boat in, there will be um, a safety rib which comes and kind of goes into the boat and knocks it to help you moor it in a certain way. And as soon as the safety rib touched the boat, the engine died on the safety rib. Get me off this boat. <laughs> Do it as a party. Thank you so much for being on the interview. You have been enlightening, entertaining, and charming as ever. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Can't wait to listen to it. Ooh. <laughs> For those willing to change the world one step at a time. For those dreaming of sustainable living. For those striving to find a healthier balance. For those always believing. Browns and Viridian. Love the planet, love yourself.